Good morning. It is Good morning. time to begin, and uh, thankful that you're here. I'm thankful to be here. Uh, what a great lectureship. What a blessing it is to be a part uh, of the study today as we think about God is. And uh, there are very few subjects that we can tread into that immediately go very deep. And any time we study about the Godhead, uh, we're studying about uh, a topic that we will never find the fullness of it. And it will be amazing to even see on the other side uh, how much more we can learn about God. But let's think about God is. Uh, God is great all the time, all the time. God is great. Now, when we think about that, we think about his goodness. And is he really good all the time? Uh, we'll give a study of that in a moment. And, but also, as we think about God's goodness, we want to also give thought to whether or not we appreciate it, and how that would apply to our life to make a difference. In other words, if God is good, and it does not change or alter our life, we have missed the great blessing of God's goodness. First, I'd like you to think with me about where we came from. In Genesis, the first chapter, at the end of each day, you remember what was said. God said, it is good. So the very creation we enjoy is a result of a good God who created all that is good. But then also think, and if you want to flip over real quick to Exodus 33, I'm just going to throw out two or three things for introduction, and then we're going to go to a single passage. So all the goodness that we enjoy comes from God. We see that uh, by example in, in Genesis 1, Genesis 2. But also now we look at Moses seeking the glory of God. Do you remember that in Genesis? In, I'm sorry, in Exodus uh, 32 and 33, and he he wants to see the glory of God, and he says in 18, "Please show me your glory." And remember, this is where God is going to send him up on on a cleft of a rock, and and he's not going to let him see his face, but you know he's going to hold his hand over him and he's going to let him see him. But do you remember how God explained what He was going to allow him to see? This is kind of powerful to our topic today. Look at verse 19. God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. What passed before him? All of the goodness of God. God's goodness is the sum total of all of his attributes. In other words, you will not study any attribute of God that is not good. Now, that also includes his justice. And a part of his justice is that he will commit judgment against individuals. Uh, throughout the Old Testament, we see the judgment against the nations. And so we see that destruction and even as we watch that destruction, we have to pause and ask ourselves, is that good? Is that part of the goodness of God? Yes. All of the attributes of God, the sum total of them, is the goodness of God. And so when, when Moses uh, was privileged to see the goodness of God pass by, it was all my goodness that was shown. So all goodness is from God. All the sum total of God's attributes are good. And then finally, by introduction, I'd like to remind you in Matthew, the 19th chapter, you may remember that this is the story of the rich young ruler, uh, beginning in verse 16. He calls him good teacher. And so it's from that that Jesus answers in verse 17. Remember his answer? He answers with a question. Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep my commandments. So what do we learn in that question and explanation that Jesus gives him? We learn that there is no other source of good. We learn that the further we pull away from God, the further we pull away from good. We learn that if we ever leave God, we cannot leave God to go find another source of good. And so by introduction, here's three things that we've seen quickly, just attributes of God brought together is good. God is 
good. God is good. But number three, we see there's no other source for good. We cannot leave God and find something else that's good. Okay, having all of that just kind of as a little bit of a backdrop uh, to, to pull from, I'd like to invite you for much of the rest of the time to Psalm 73. If you'll be turning there, we're going to look at several verses out of Psalm 73. When I said to you earlier, I said it's important for us to know God is good and appreciate it, but then it's also important that we know how to properly apply it to our life. A misunderstanding of good can quickly cause someone to stumble in their faith and lose their soul. Say it again. A misunderstanding of good can quickly cause someone to stumble in their faith and to lose their soul. Psalm the 73rd chapter, Asaph is very honest with us. He, we're, we're going to see this, but I just want you to be looking for what we're about to read through. He is going to declare the goodness of God, but then he's going to back up and he's going to say, but let me tell you about when I didn't understand that fully. And he says, here was a time where I almost lost my faith. And the reason I almost lost my faith is because I had a misunderstanding of good. In other words, he had the wrong definition for good. And so because he applied goodness to evil, he had that misunderstanding, he almost lost his soul. And so then the question is, in this, what was the turning point? What is it that put his compass back in a proper direction? And we see that turning point, and then we see the summary that directed his life so that he could properly understand a God of goodness. So here's how it goes. You have to love the first four words of this chapter. Truly, God is good. So we think about today, what are we studying? We're studying God is good. And he begins with saying, truly. This is something that you can take to the bank every day. This is something in every situation in which you see God, you can always count on this. Truly, God is good. But what about when you see a lot of things that aren't good? What is going to be your summary of those things? Well, that's where he almost got off on the wrong path. Let's read verse 1. Truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, here it is, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. What is it that he looks back and says, I almost lost my way here. I almost lost my faith. You know, all through Scripture, we see that the way with the Lord is oftentimes described as a path. Now, that's throughout wisdom and, and, and Hebrew poetry, all through there, is the, the, the path, the righteous path. But you remember when Jesus spoke about it in the Sermon on the Mount? He said that way was called what? Difficult. And so we have a misunderstanding when we think in our mind, like the metaphor, the picture of walking with the Lord is this nice, you know, good three, four foot wide path, and it's real flat, and it's real easy to walk on, and you're saying, I'm on the path of the Lord. It's never that way. The path is a difficult path. That's why we have to walk it, walking circumspectly. You know, the idea of the word circumspect is to carefully place each step. This path of walking with the Lord is difficult because we have an enemy but also because it's against our human nature. And so we have to carefully place each step. Asaph is telling us about a time where he didn't carefully place his steps. And what he found himself, he found himself on the edge, on this slippery slope where he was about to lose his way completely off that path. And you know, I don't know if this surprises you or not as we study this today, but really what it came down to was he started calling evil good. Now, that sounds like Isaiah 5, doesn't it? You remember when, when he starts passing out some of those woe passages there? And he already called them out for their greediness. Then he called them out for their intoxication. Then he pretty much just described, you're in the bondage of sin. <coughs> and then he said, woe to you who call good evil and evil good. It is very, very possible for us to give the wrong definition of good. 
it is very possible for us to look at things that are 100% evil and say, oh, that's good. I'm really envious of that. I really would like to take some of that into my life. I'd like to be able to do that. That looks really, really good. And he says, that's where I was. I was on that slippery path. I was really losing my way. So how did it look? Let's, let's read and scan some of these things here. In verse 3 he says, this is where he begins describing this way. He says, I was envious of the boastful. I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Now, in this envy for wicked people, he also uh, was very deceptive. Now, you know that John 8, Jesus called Satan the father of lies. So he's always going to lie to us. And so what we're about to read here, of course, is a lot of deception. This wasn't how it was. It's how he perceived that it was. And so it was things like verse 4. There was no pains in their death. That's pretty deceptive, isn't it? Wow, I see these people over here that I used to think were wicked. Wow, I envy them now. Even when they die, they don't have deaths like we have. And they have riches. They have things to boast of. Look at the rest of verse 4. Their strength is firm. And verse 5, they're not in trouble as other men are. Verse 6, their pride serves them as a necklace. In other words, I used to think pride was bad. Look, they wear it with honor. It's a good thing. And look at their violence. Their violence just covers them right up like a garment. And, and what he's implying is it works to their advantage. Look how good it is for them. 7, their eyes bulge with abundance. Wow, I wish I could have a life where I just get more and more of the good stuff. And then he speaks to their pride again in verse 8. As they scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression, they speak loftily. In other words, they speak with pride. Well, what do they say? Uh, skip down to verse 11. They say things like this. Now, keep in mind, they're scoffing here. How does God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? And then this is his summary of them. Behold. These are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. He says, I was envious of them. I was envious because it just seemed like their life was so easy. They didn't have troubles like the rest of us. They could even die in peace, and, and we don't get to enjoy that. And he says, and when it came to, to pride and lifting up themselves, it just seemed to be the way to live. They could even do violence, and it seemed like the way to do. Their, their possessions were increasing. Their life was at ease. Wow, I find myself envious of what I used to think was bad. But I'm beginning to think it's pretty good. This is looking like the good things in life. Maybe I've been wrong because then he looks at his own life very briefly here. Look at verse 13 and 14. He says, surely I've cleansed my heart in vain. I've washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I've been plagued and chastened every morning. He said, here, they have all this abundance and this peaceful living. Their life is really going great. And then I'm over here saying, well, I don't need to be evil. I need to purify my heart. I need to cleanse my hands. And what's it for? It's for vanity. Because I'm the one being plagued. They don't have the plagues like I have. I'm the one being chastised by God. I'm the one being punished. And they're not even having the punishment. And that's his explanation to say, that's where I was when I was on the edge of this slippery slope. What changed? What turned? I need to know that because there's times that I look at sin and it looks more appealing than what, as a child of God, I ought to think that it looks you look at the temptations in your life, why is it tempting? If we could see the whole picture, would it be tempting? That's what we're going to see in this chapter. Why is it tempting? It can always be tempting when we narrow our focus and we only see the parts that we perceive or have been deceived to think is good. And so how do we back up? How, how do we see the whole picture? Notice this turning point. This turning point in verse 16 and 17 gives us an idea. When I thought how to understand this. Now don't, don't miss that phrase. That's important. See what he's saying here? I, I knew I needed to understand this. I, I, I knew I was really getting myself way off course here. So he says, I thought how to understand this. And it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then 
I understood their end. Now, I'm going to pause there just to let this sink in. We're, he's not through describing this here. But, but let's think about that. What do you mean when he says, I went to the sanctuary? Well, we don't know exactly what he means, but, but we know that the idea of sanctuary means the dwelling place of God. And we know that the temple or the tabernacle had the Holy of Holies and that individuals would come there to worship God. They would come to draw near to God. Whatever it is, uh, in detail, we, we know for certain what the principle is. The principle is, he was saying, I was getting over here off the edge. I was pulling away from God. Remember this backdrop I gave to you at the very beginning of the first three things? If God is the only source for good, the further we get away from God, the further we get away from good, the less we're going to understand what is truly good. We want to get our focus back correctly. We want to really understand what is good. We draw closer to God and we have a better understanding of good. And so when, when he looked at these sinful people and he pulled back, what did he say there? We're not, we're not guessing on this. At the end of 17, what did he understand? He understood their end. We never understand goodness by first understanding on earth and then backing it up. We always understand goodness when we take it out of the realm of time and into eternity. In other words, before there was ever a heaven and earth, let me rephrase that, before there was ever an earth where we enjoyed the goodness of God, there was first the good God. He created us in the goodness. The source still goes back to God. When we leave this earth and we step out of time, what do we go back to? We go back to the source of God's goodness. And what about for those that they don't want to live close to a good God? And so they die eternally. What is their end? Their end is away from all that is good. And so he says, I had to draw near to God again really get an idea of the big picture he looked at this wickedness and he said not how does it look today how does it look in the end for those who practice such things and he said then I quickly summarized their end is not what it's not good it looked really good at this moment but it's not good now that's what I need to remember when I'm struggling with temptation if all I'm looking at is the immediate gratification that may come from some kind of fleshly or pride-filled fulfillment. I need to back up a little bit and say, okay, so it does look good to me at the moment. Remember, there's pleasure in sin for a season. It does <coughs> look good to me at the moment. But what about the end of this sin? If I indulge in this, and that is the way I meet my maker, I am going to become one that practices this sin, what's the end going to be? It's not going to be good. So, the way he understood this was to draw near to God and really get a better understanding of not just the earthly, but the eternal. Now, he continually describes this, and it's really some, of course, great teachings here. And so let's continue this very saying, uh, this is still about him trying to understand it. He says, surely you set them in slippery places. So now he realizes, see, before, uh, remember at the end of verse 4, he thought their strength was firm. See, back when he was believing the lies, he thought, wow, they're standing on solid ground. They're the ones doing well. And he says, now I understand. They're not the ones doing well. They're on the slippery places, and the end is going to be destruction for them. Verse 18. And, um, and so then, verse, nine, uh, verse 20. As a dream... Well, let me go ahead and get 19 so we have the, the full thought here. Oh, how they are brought to desolation. As in a moment, they are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream, when one awakes. So, Lord... When you awake, you shall despise their image. Okay, so we need to do two things here. First, we need to talk about can a good God cast judgment upon individuals and allow them to be destroyed and still be a good God? Now we, in our backdrop of things, the, the second is that when all of God's goodness passed before Moses, we summarize in that that all of the characteristic or the attributes of God, the sum total of them are good. And so we can bring any of these questions to God and the summary will still be He is good. Uh, we have to bring into this discussion uh, a similar thought that 
uh, earlier today when we talked about God's faithfulness. It, it's the same, and it, it runs, these two run parallel uh, throughout Scripture, Old and New Testament. And that is whether you want to talk about God's justice and His faithfulness or God's goodness and His justice. And so, is God a just God? Yes. Is He a good God? Yes. How can He be good and punish so severely? Well, how could He be just if He didn't punish severely? I want you to imagine that. The latest school shooting. And we're going to have to alter this a little bit to really give some application as if it were the Lord. But I want you to imagine that that uh, that young man stands trial before God. And all the evidence is brought. And, and without any doubt, he is 100% guilty of murdering, cold-blooded murder, 17 individuals and injuring so much more. And imagine, imagine this with no jury. Just, just imagine this with the judge. And the judge says, you know you are guilty. But you know what? I love you. And I'm a good person. And I want you to be able to go home. And I want you to have supper tonight with the people that you love. And I tell you what, let's just put this behind us and let's pretend like it didn't happen. Take the handcuffs off. You're free to go. Go out and enjoy life just because I'm a good judge. You know what would immediately be declared? I'm not talking about just the godly. All across the world, what would immediately be declared is that is not a good judge. Good <coughs> judges do not dishonor justice in that way. Justice deserved to be served. That judge was not good. Look what they did. Now, if we can understand that fully, 100% in our human realm, think how much more so it's true. Remember, there's a couple of passages in Deuteronomy, one of them is a really long chapter, where God laid out very, very clearly, if you keep my commandments, I will bring these blessings into your life. And then He laid out, if you do not keep my commandments, and it's the longer portion of the chapter, and he talked about all of the horrific judgment that would be cast upon Israel. And you know what? As long as Israel obeyed God, all of those blessings flowed into their lives and into their nation. And when they left God, all of those curses, including eating their own children, passed through all of their lives in that nation. Why? It's the justice of God. And so it's interesting here that he kind of had to back up and he had to see the bigger picture. And he had to see, remember how this chapter began? Truly God is good. And this good God, he looked at the judgment that was going to come at the end of all these that he thought for a moment, wow, they're really doing good. And he looked what it was going to lead to in judgment and he said, okay, I was wrong. The closer I drew good, the, tr the closer I drew near to the good God, the more I realized what the end of these people were. And then here, here's the key to this right here. Here's the key. That last verse that we just read in verse 20, he says, well, really, it was like waking up from a dream. Let that sink in how powerful it is. The closer we get to God, the more we have those aha moments. You know how when you have a dream and it seems really, really real? You know what I'm talking about? And like maybe you wake up in the middle of the night, and, and have you ever had that where you, you wake up in the night and you kind of have that talk with yourself, and you're like, is that true or was that a dream? Like that that really seemed like that happened, but I know I'm laying here in bed in the middle of the night and I I guess it had to be a dream, but it, it really seemed like it really happened. All right, stand, this is the same story. Same story. You go back to sleep. And you go back to sleep still just a little bit confused. You wake up the next morning, you get dressed, and you go about your day. And it dawns on you. That dream last night. But now you're in the middle of the day, and you turn to a friend or, or to a coworker, and you laugh, and you say, you're not going to believe the crazy dream I had last night. And you tell them, and y'all just laugh and laugh because it's so unrealistic. 
You see the point he's making here? He says, when you're right there in the middle of it, you can't really understand if it's true or not. But if you wake up in the morning and you'll back away from it, you'll just laugh and say, how foolish was that? That's exactly what Asaph is talking about here. He said, when I was on the edge myself, it was when I got so focused in on the deception of what looked so good and he said, it wasn't until I drew near to God, who is the good God, that He helped me see the whole picture. And when I saw the whole picture, it was like waking up and being in the middle of the next day and saying, how in the world did I believe that dream? That's amazing. I could fall for that. But we do. And so he continues here by talking about this new place that he has now of a better understanding and he regrets in 21 and 22 that like 22, he was foolish. He was ignorant. He says, I was like a beast before you. I don't know exactly what he means by that, but I think about animals, you know, not having the ability to reason and to be logical. And uh, have you ever tried to help an animal that was injured and, and you know, they, they maybe snap at you or, or fight you and you think to yourself, if they could just understand, they, they would know. They, they could just, they, they could know that I'm trying to help them. And they wouldn't do this. I guess that may be what he's talking about when he's looking toward God now. He, he's awakened. He's seeing the bigger picture now. He's close to God. He says, God, I was so ignorant. I was so foolish. And I probably really mistreated you. I was like a beast to you. And now I realize you look... And I'm not saying by any means that Job treated God like a beast, but do you remember when Job went through a lot that he didn't fully understand? And even at the end, he didn't fully understand it. But what did he come to an understanding? He came to an understanding that God is good and you can trust Him. That's really the summary of the book of Job. The 42nd chapter, I believe it's verse 5, where he says, I realize I've been speaking about things too wondrous for me to understand. In other words, God, you understand them. And, and they're wondrous to you and you can make good things work out through this and, and I was kind of like a beast and, and I was kind of doubting you and accusing you and I should have just been much more humble I shouldn't have been so ignorant I shouldn't have been so foolish and again I, I hate to almost even say that towards Job because I don't think Job was a beast but, but it's that mentality it's that wow if I could just understand what God understands and, and then when I don't understand it if at least I could trust him and I can know that he's good and have faith to say, okay, I don't see this with my eyes right now, but I know you do see the whole picture and this is going to be okay. And so that's his regret that he speaks of, but then he speaks of the positive in, in 23 that God is continually with him and, and God's holding him by the right hand, so that's a position of strength to be able to hold him up. But then also notice this guidance. You'll guide me with your counsel. What a beautiful thought. You're going to hold me up. And, and you know, this path is not easy. This path can be difficult. And you're going to give me counsel about how to stay on this path. But notice now, remember before, he took the wicked and talked about their end. Notice he's going to talk about his end. And afterward, receive me to glory. So now he says... Now that I'm awakened from the dream, in other words, now I'm seeing the big picture, I see my end too. I've already seen the end of the wicked. Now he says, I get to see my end. You're good. You're going to hold me up. You're good. You're going to give me guidance that I need. And you're good. You're going to take me on to a reward that is your glory. Now remember, that's what Moses asked to see in Exodus 33. He wanted to see God's glory. And what was God's answer? I'll let my goodness pass before you. So a part of the glory of God is His goodness. And He says, you're going to let me see your goodness. You're, you're going to take me to where on the other side, I'll see your glory in a fullness like I've never seen it before. And so, uh, so then that brings us in, in 27 and 28 uh, well, we, we, we can go ahead and look at 25 and 26. He's kind of con concluding here. And he says, Whom I have in heaven but you, uh, and there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. 
Now, see, that's a big difference from before. He was desiring the wicked. Now he's desiring God. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. The, the idea of portion is allotment. You know, you, you, you go up to goods that's been divided up and you say, what's your portion? And you say, this, this is my portion right here. He looks at his life. And it wasn't that long ago he's looking back and he, and he said, hey, what's your portion? He said, I'll tell you what I'd really like to have. He said, these wicked people, they wear pride like a necklace. They can go out and get involved in violence and it seems to always work to their benefit. They, they get increase of goods. And you know what happens next month? They just get more goods. That's what I like my portion to be. I'd like that. But now he's awakened from the dream by drawing closer to God. And now he says, you know who my portion is now? That's not, that's not my portion. He says, my strength and my portion God. Why? Because of the way he began this. Truly, God is good. And so as a, a, a true teacher would do, Asaph can't, that's the end of the, the chapter, per se. But he can't end it right there. He, he's got to give the summary, almost as if to say, okay, now what do we learn today? And so what he's, what he's going to do in one verse, he's just going to go and say, so do you see how negative the negative is when you start thinking that wicked is good? And then in contrast, he says, do you see how good it is when you see that the good is good? When you see God is good? And so here's his summary. Verse 27. Here's the negative. For indeed, those who are far from you, now I want to keep in mind, God is good. So those who are far from you, what's their end going to be? It's not going to be good. It's going to be perishing. You have destroyed all those. He can do that because he's a good God. Justice demands that he does that. Who deserts you for harlotry. Okay, but now here's the, the contrast. And we see it's a contrast because it starts with the word but. But it is good for me to draw near to God. Because see, that's drawing near to this good God. I have put my trust in the Lord God, that I may declare all your works. Now, in the, the last couple minutes, few minutes we have here, I want to share with you one of the amazing things, and you know this, I just want to remind you of it as, as we study this topic of God's goodness. It's so easy to look at things that are intrinsically good and attribute them to God. But what's amazing with God is how he's able to even take situations that are not good. Can you remember Romans 8, 28? All things work together for good. Those who love the Lord, those who are called according to his purpose. Now, now think about that. He did not say all things are good, but he says all things can work together for good. What does that mean? Well, we see an example of Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 wanting the thorn removed and he prayed three times for it to be removed and it just seems like that and remember that, that was delivered to him by a messenger of Satan to buffet him that, that was sent so it wasn't good that he had it it was from Satan it wasn't good that he had it but God now has the opportunity to answer his prayer exactly as he's asked and that was Lord remove it but you know what our good God always does? Our good God, He never sleeps, does He? So He's not dreaming. He always sees the big picture. He's able to look at what has happened in the life of Paul. And He knows Paul has been able to go up and to see in heaven and to hear things that He's not even allowed to come back and utter upon earth. And He knows that it could easily become a stumbling block of pride for Paul. And so this good God that can see the whole picture says, you know what? I'm just going to leave that thorn in his flesh. And he's going to see it as a weakness. But my strength will come up beside his weakness and my grace will be sufficient for him. So he and his ministry is going to thrive. And that thorn is going to keep him humble. Why? Because I want his end to be good. I need to realize that the good God that we serve is much more concerned about you and I having that goodness for eternity with Him than anything else on this earth. And that's why in Romans 8, He makes it very clear that whatever trials that we have here is worth it for the glory that is to come. 
the sum total of all His goodness, the glory that, that we experience, it's worth whatever we experience here. You know, perhaps on earth, one of the, the clearest ways to see it over a long period of time where a young man could have spent a long time, and, and I don't know that he ever did this, but, but can you imagine how many decades Joseph could have walked around scratching his head saying, God, why are you letting this happen to me? But you remember the very end, Genesis 50? You remember his brothers thought that he was going to kill them when he had the opportunity. And remember his explanation wasn't that. He says, you meant it for evil. But God intended it for good. God can always see the big picture. And He can steer the things that are intrinsically good, but He can even take the things that are not good for those that love Him, and He can even steer those in a way that it works out for good. But that only works out for those who draw near to Him as the good God. But the only way we know it is to pull back from temptation far enough to see the whole picture. And anytime we see the whole picture of God's goodness, or even when we see the whole picture of temptation, it helps us to keep our feet planted in the path where God will be our right arm of strength, God will be the one giving us counsel for each step. And God will be the one saying, and after this life, I will give you a place of glory. So, I'd like to conclude this with the very same chapter that I concluded in an earlier session. And this is just briefly for what it's worth. Go with me, if you will, to Lamentations. In Lamentations, we have a funeral dirge as Jerusalem has uh, been burned and destroyed. And uh, I, I remind you that it was a beautiful city. I remind you it was their holy city. The temple was absolutely an amazing structure uh, that, that you could put it in a category of if you go to the most amazing structures that's ever been. It was an amazing structure. It was their home. Uh, it was a place they loved. And now they, they wake up and they see the desolation. And you remember, they're receiving that desolation because of the judgment of God. God told them, you, you leave me and I'll cast judgment against you. And, and so here we see Jeremiah, uh, he writes this lamp, lamenting, he writes this funeral dirge, he's, he's looking at God's wrath, he's looking at God's judgment, but he's also looking at the remnant that's been preserved, a few went to Egypt, a few went to Babylon, and, and so it's in the midst of this that he has, uh, in his sorrow, it's, it's lamenting, but it's in the midst that he has some optimistic moments. And so we read an optimistic moment, uh, starting verse 22, when we were talking about God's faithfulness. Because remember in verse 23, he said, Great is your faithfulness. But I'd like for you to look at verse 25. Here he is in the midst of, of seeing God's judgment. Here he is in the midst of thinking, but you know what? If we walk with God again, things can be really good in our lives again. And so it's in the midst of all of that pain and probably some confusion that he says, The Lord is good. To those who wait for Him. To the soul who seeks Him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. God is good. Let's bow. Our most gracious God, we thank You for loving us. We love You, God, and we praise You for Your goodness. God, we see you, we realize our weaknesses and our frailty, and we realize how so often we're simply not good. And we realize that the only hope that we have is waiting upon you and drawing near to you and allow your goodness to become our goodness. God, in the times that we're starting to misunderstand goodness and wickedness, pray that you give us wisdom to wake up and step back and to step toward you. And God, at the times that we're experiencing your goodness, we pray that we'd always be humble and grateful and give you all the glory. God, thank you for such rich text as we've studied today in Psalms. 
we pray that we'll always have you as our great God. And it's through your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.